Hello, hello, Kilt Africa Tribe. It's me, Jason, and welcome to the pilot episode of Kilt Africa TV. It has been almost seven years since Kilt Africa Fabric started, and from being a humble textile shop to a now global player exclusively providing African fabrics to over 63 nations worldwide, Kilt Africa Fabrics continues to exist all thanks to all our patrons who unceasingly show their support since day one. And what better way to celebrate Thanksgiving and show our gratitude is by bringing you closer to credible speakers and relevant resources through Kilt Africa TV. So let's connect and discuss. Don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe to our channel for exciting and new content. For a pilot episode, we shall be talking about what Kilt Africa Fabrics has for you. So joining us for today is none other than the owner herself, Ms. Miriam Galadima Benson. Hi, Miriam. So how are you doing today? How are you feeling right now? Oh, I'm happy. I mean, I'm so grateful. It's Thanksgiving, of course. And um, this pilot episode couldn't have really added. That is so true. So speaking of Thanksgiving, happy yeah. Thanksgiving, Miriam. What are you thankful for this year this thanksgiving um like everyone else i'm happy for family for being alive and healthy you know and but most of all i think i'm really happy that you know i get to live my dream through quilt africa fabrics the growth that we've experienced you know over the years uh yeah so these are my top three things that i'm really grateful for Oh, that's great. Me, I'm thankful for having you as my guest for today, as well as um for having this opportunity to work with you in Kilt Africa Fabrics. So let's talk about Kilt Africa Fabrics. What is the story behind Kilt Africa Fabrics and the brand itself, the company? Can you share it with us? Oh, of course. Um, So Kilt Africa Fabrics started in February of 2017. Mm -hmm. um, in 2016, I just got it in my head to make a quilt. It's a story I've shared so many times, but it never loses its wonder for me. I went online, um, learned how to make a quilt, and I shared it in a Facebook group. And they were so enthusiastic about me being a new quilter and using African fabrics. And so the requests for the fabrics, you know, were coming in. And so with the encouragement of Sue Griffiths and um, Miranda Rowland, I incorporated a company and immediately started trading as Quilt Africa Fabrics. That's fantastic. So from becoming a newbie quilter, you started a company. And then now, after seven years, we are now serving to 63 countries worldwide. And that's so amazing, right? So I know. It's <laughs> amazing. <laughs> that is very true. But... From the beginning, what inspired you to start your own textile business, aside from having that encouragement from the community? Well, I think the, the first thing, the first thing really is my love affair with fabrics, mm -hmm. which has been going on since I was a girl of about eight or so. When my mom took me to the fabric markets because she was a fabrics dealer herself, she was a stay-at-home mom who was buying and reselling fabrics to friends you know and neighbors and the people around her so she used to take me to those markets and it was there I learned so much about fabrics um, learned to just um, love the fresh cotton smell you know uh -huh. appreciate the patterns you know and learn the history you know of um, both the African wax prints and the culture associated with um, patterns and symbols in Africa as well that's so amazing. I really give the credit to my mom. <laughs> <laughs> it's a family affair, I think. So basically, considering your background, I believe you are you have a background in architecture, correct? Um, being into textile. How did you begin your journey into the textile industry, coming from your background in architecture? Well, to be honest, um, architecture and textile arts quilting is uh -huh. not too far removed. Okay. Because you always start with an idea, with inspiration, you know, you, you start with a brief, deciding what you want to get done, you know, and then you begin to move elements, 
the same elements, the same geometric elements, the curves and the shapes, you know, until you have a pleasing form, uh -huh. you know, that um that serves the purpose for which, you know, you imagined in your head. So honestly, for me, architecture is much more structured, much uh -huh. more uh, rigid, but quilting gives me this the liberty to be free you know, and just to express myself in a way that pleases only me, unlike in architecture where you're pleasing the government, the authorities, you're pleasing your clients, you know, and so many other rules. I could, um, quilting just allows me to be free and um, create for myself. Oh, I see. So basically, it's like doing what makes you happy, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. It's amazing that you mentioned that. So, um, Let's talk about the things that makes you happy. What are the memorable moments that you had when you started your business, the Kilt Africa Fabrics? Oh my goodness, they are, I mean, every day is a miracle for me to get to do this, to get to interact with people all over the world, you know, to get to serve them, to get to listen to them, to get to know them and become friends with them. But along the way, there are certain milestones, you know, that we, that, um, we as a team, as me as the owner, you know, and then as a community that we have um, had that has is stuck in my head, you know, it can't just go away. The first thing was actually launching the website. You know, um, I created, I actually created the website in December of 2016, but I was so afraid. I was so scared. I started to doubt myself. And so for about six weeks, I just sat on it. I didn't hit the publish button. So the website was created. The business was ready to go, but fear just didn't let me move forward. And so what the first memorable time was when I hit the button February 1st in 2017, and the website became live and I officially became a business owner. You know, I became the owner of Cult Africa Fabrics. The next one that I remember was in quick succession, the very first order you know, that I got um, for fabrics from for some fat quarters to have that shipped to Texas in the US. I was, I was, my mind was blown. Here I was this Nigerian woman, woman with um, two toddlers, you know, struggling to find my way, didn't want to go back into paid employment. And all of a sudden some random person who is now a very personal and close friend, Kathy, just places an order. She doesn't know me. She just sees the store. She loves the fabrics and she just placed an order. That was, I think that was, that is a, the most um, memorable milestone. And then of course, when I got to incorporate um, my company, I got to be able to trade, you know, as an international business person. And like you said, over the years, I didn't even realize we've traded with up to 63 countries. And so that is just amazing. When I hear that, I mean, a feather can knock me over because it's so amazing. I started with a very small dream. And, you know, just seven years later, here we are. Another memorable one was in 2020 when I decided to host the first Quilt Africa Summit. Mm -hmm. um, I was full of nerves. Fear has been my worst friend. It's so familiar to me. And it's, I, I always fight a constant battle with fear. And so the same fear, you know, gripped me and I knew I needed to do it, but I was so afraid as well. But I'm so glad that the experiences have shaped me and emboldened me, you know? And so I hosted the first summit and it was so filled with so many issues, you know, but people appreciated the effort and the time and the information that I gave, you know? And so that was just amazing. And um, other milestones, milestones include growing the Quilt Africa community to the thousands now. I think across all our social media platforms, we are like 10,000 strong. That is so amazing to me. I don't take it for granted. Um, you know, and just being able to serve people, being able to make friends, so many personal friends who reach out to me, we chat, you know, we get to know each other. And just to have that connectedness with people all over the world. I think for me, that is another milestone that I can't just get over. So there are actually many moments, but I'll just leave that, you know, for now. 
that's amazing. Um, you do have shared a lot of moments with Kilt Africa Fabrics as well as the community. You've mentioned the Kilt Africa tribe, and I, for one, is a member of the tribe, and I can see a lot of people, a lot of the members are really engaged and are really actively involved in what the community is doing. So right now, as we speak, Kilt Africa Fabrics is now part of the global market. How do you di differentiate your business um, in a competitive textile market? Huh. Um, okay, so to be honest, the, my first motivation for starting Kilt Africa Fabrics was to have something to do. I'd left my job. Um, I was with young kids. I needed something to engage myself with and to make an income. So I, it started off with me wanting to make an income, doing something that I enjoyed and something that would allow me to stay at home with my kids who were quite young at that time. So that was how it started. But by the time I got to know people, honestly, the focus of the business shifted. Yes, income was major, you know, because it helps me to feel good about myself. Prior to Quilt Africa Fabrics, I'd been out of work for some years. So it just felt good to have money to my name that I could spend, you know, on what I wanted. But over time, the focus of Quilt Africa Fabrics has shifted. So if you're talking to me in terms of competitive advantage, I don't think that is my, that is where I look at. I concentrate on the sense of community and belonging that I have not even to mention the members of the tribe, but I feel so accepted. I feel useful. You know, uh -huh. I feel like I'm giving, you know, and um, I'm just grateful that people see that and they appreciate it, you know, and they come back to the store and they purchase and they do business with me, you know. But for me, it's honestly the sense of belonging, the sense of community, the, the wonder of reaching out to so many women all over the world that continually remains my motivation. You know, while I'm still grateful that I'm able to earn a living, make an income, you know, just doing what I love with people who I tremendously appreciate and I'm grateful for. That's amazing. The genuine of the brand and the owner itself is really amazing and inspiring. Um, For me as part of the company, it makes me proud to have that sincere goal to be uh, to be an influence, to serve influence to the community. So Absolutely. let's talk about your love affair with African fabrics. Many are curious, yes. how does African fabrics differ from other fabrics? Okay, so I think that the, the most um, the, the most beautiful thing about African fabrics, it's it's intense interconnectedness to culture and tradition. You know, just like everything African, culture and tradition is really at the center of it. And so even though African fabrics are not indigenous to Africa, but because Africans have embraced it and they have put their stamp on it, if you like, you know, they have transferred the essence of culture and they've put it into the fabrics, that in itself distinguishes it from most types of fabrics around the world. Another thing is the quality of the fabrics. In Quilt Africa Fabrics, I make sure that we, we source and supply to our customers good quality fabrics, 100% cotton, tightly woven, good weight, um, beautiful, you know, um, just good quality. So I think for me, and of course, that is, that is not to say that they are not poor quality products. There are poor quality African fabrics all over the place, you know, but when you find good quality African fabrics, it just makes you happy. The colors are bright and beautiful and vibrant. It makes you think of candy or celebration. You know, the, the, the patterns are bold. They tell a story. They allow your eyes to feed, you know, on the different arrangements, you know, of the patterns and the color. And then the just the quality of it that it's good weight, it's cotton. So it works in any kind of uh, climate, you know, and then, um, yeah, the culture that is associated with it. So I think for me, that is the edge that African fabrics have over other types of fabric. That's nice to, see, to hear actually coming from a different culture. Um, it allows us to express 
and explore different aspect of the fabric into our personal or unique expression of ourselves. So yes. that's actually yes. a nice point that you've shared with us. And now, how do you select um the products that you will showcase, the fabrics? How do you go on with it? Yeah. So over the years, um, African Fabrics has has um, enjoyed a renaissance and uh, an evolution as well. You find that the way it used to be sourced and sold has drastically changed over time. And so right now, there are many players in the African um, wax prints and African fabrics um, markets. There are many players, and so there's a lot of competition, um, new designs, new patterns, new influences, you know, are always in the market. So what I do is I look out for the best. I just simply get into the market, browse around, um, identify the suppliers who are, are on top of their game, you know, and then I identify the brands that are, that are trendy, you know, that are on point. And then because I now know what my customers also like, you know, all of these factors just put together, just help me make the best decisions that um, I can. Sometimes the fabrics that you're looking for are not in the market, you know, but you can still find a few gems. But most of the time you have a, an influx of fabrics. And so you need to take the time to identify the ones that work, you know, for us as um, creators and quilters, you know, and that is what, what I curate and then I present to the tribe and to um, everyone else interested. That's amazing to hear. Um, so basically, the products that you showcase in the company are your personal choices. Most likely, yes? Yes. Yeah. Well, not really. When I first started, it was about my personal choice because okay. that was safe for me. You know, uh -huh. it was safe, what I liked. And so I put that in the market. But over time, I found out that I wasn't doing the quilters and the textile artists any justice by restricting my, the selections to my personal taste. These are, I mean, 100% of the people in our community are skilled, uh -huh. are creative, um, and they just do amazing things no matter the boundaries you place on them. As you can tell from our challenges, our challenges come with rules, but every time they blow my mind. So I felt that I was doing an injustice by restricting everyone to my personal preferences, my personal oh. colors, my personal um, the, um, patterns and stuff. So I, I broadened my range. Uh -huh. I started going after colors that I personally would be like, oh, you know, and then patterns that were maybe too bold or too tame for me you know and so right now in in the store you find a broad range of fabrics different colors different patterns just a wide range so it appeals to every type of quilter and for every type of project you know that they're looking to use the fabrics for that's amazing so um it's quite nice that you've mentioned that it basically depends on the user the quilters themselves they are very skilled and mm -hmm. it's amazing to know that even though they are skilled they still appreciate your product they always always say that they love your fabrics they love the colors so basically it comes down to how you manage the purchases that you do for your fabrics and how you put them together and make it interesting for the receivers or our or clients or customers. So it's amazing to hear. But I think one of the major major concern of our customers or clients and some other kilters who would like to explore African fabrics is about um the exclusivity of African fabrics. Are African fabrics exclusively made in Africa for Africans? Well, um African fabrics, the wax print are exclusively made for the African market, but they are not made in Africa in the sense that we do not have many indigenous um, companies, many indigenously African companies that produce these fabrics. Most of the fabrics are products of other countries, Asian countries, European countries, you know, and they are brought into Africa, you know, and but they are consumed by Africans. 
Um, the few companies we have in Africa that produce are owned by the Dutch company, the Velisco company. So they set up baby companies in Ghana, in uh-huh. Cote d'Ivoire, I think, you know, and then they they produce and supply um, the African market. But the thing about the African market is that it's a huge market. So even the existing meals in Africa cannot cater to the whole of Africa. They certainly cannot cater to West Africa or Nigeria particularly, because in Nigeria, we are over 100 million. And every single person in Nigeria uses African prints. And so in a year, on average, one person can buy up to 10. So this is just a rough estimate. If you go 10 by over 100 million, 120 million, you can see the the volume of prints that are needed, you know? And so that is just, um, so it it just means that we need more meals in Africa. We need more indigenous meals in Africa, you know, that are just not there for now, you know? But I'm also happy that even though some of the fabrics come from other countries, Indigenous um, business owners like myself partner with some of these mills and they produce their designs out of the country because Africa is also challenged, you know, with infrastructural um, issues, poor power, um, poor, you know, and all the other economic issues that I don't want to go into now. But so African fabrics are produced for Africans, but they are not majorly produced in Africa or owned by Africans. That's just the short, you know, um, answer to that. Oh, I see. So um, what will you say to those who are afraid of using African fabrics or who are actually hesitant in cutting the fabric? Because I, I, I usually get that comment that they're afraid to cut the fabric. They're afraid to use the fabric because of... Um, it might not be appropriate in their culture. So what can you tell them? Okay, so I think um, that question, I can address it to two sets of people. The first set of people are people who just love the fabrics and they buy them and they store them and they don't want to cut them. They don't want to (laughs) use them. Um, I created a mantra for our community and I said, you have to cut the fabrics. You have to stop worshipping the fabrics. You have to use the fabrics because the fabrics are so beautiful. They give joy to other people. So you make, you use the fabrics, you gift the fabrics, or you just exhibit the fabric, you know, the what you create from the fabrics. So don't be afraid of cutting. The truth is that so many styles and designs are coming out and you would want some of that. So what you have used, because there are many more, equally or even more beautiful designs and fabrics that will be coming out in the future. Um, To the second set of people who are worried about how appropriate it it is for them to use the fabrics, especially if they are people of other ethnicities and races, um, I, I always say that I respond from my point of view as an African. African culture is very accommodating, it's very welcoming. Um... We find so much joy when people appreciate our food, our culture, our dances, our music, our art. You know, the only thing that hurts is when um, our openness with our culture and our things is taken and taken advantage of. You know, case in point, artworks have been taken out of Africa by colonial powers they are in their in their museums in France, in Germany, in Britain, and they don't want to return them. So I think it's from that point of view that it um it becomes inappropriate. But in a situation where you appreciate the culture, you you know the stories behind the fabrics, and you just love it because of its beauty, and you see it as a point of connection to another culture and you use it as a as an opportunity for understanding and acceptance, then I see absolutely nothing wrong with it. So for me, that's my take. That's very nice to hear. It's like using the fabric to have that group of people love one fabric. It's amazing to know. 
there. Yeah. So Absolutely. um in the brand you use kilt kilt why kilting? What makes kilting special for you? You you mentioned your love for African fabrics. Now let's talk about kilting. Why kilting? Oh I I think um quilting just embodies both my creative, my nostalgic, and my personal preference. Nostalgic in the sense that when I think back to my childhood, fab these fabrics have played a part, mm -hmm. you know, and when I think of my training as a professional, as an architect, I am so used to moving elements around to create something pleasing and useful, something that makes people happy, something that makes their lives better. That's essentially what I did as an architect. And then it just gave me the sense of accomplishment of seeing my structure, my design, something I thought of in my head, translated um, on, on bare ground, you know, uh -huh. um, dig the trenches, lay, lay out the design, dig the trenches, and a building comes up and eventually people are living in it and their lives are better. So for me, it's much the same way with quilting. It just, there's such a strong correlation for me, you know, um, my training and just, so So for me, quilting is like a better form of architecture because like I said, it allows me to throw away the rules and just please myself. And in pleasing myself, I please others because I believe I'm a powerful creative person Whatever I come up with becomes beautiful and I get to share that with other people. And of course, it takes far less time to make a quilt than to build a house. So I'm also very excited about that. You know, I just love the creative process of deciding my colors, deciding my fabrics, deciding my layout, the label. I actually enjoy the label of putting it all together and knowing that this came from me, made by me, you know, and I can now share it with the world. So definitely quilting because it, um, it's something you can learn. Even, you know, for, for painting, you have to have the gift. You have to have a certain amount of talent to paint. You have to have a certain amount of talent to write. But quilting is free for everyone. It doesn't matter if you feel you have no talent. It allows you to have creativity bubble up from the inside of you. And you begin by following the rules but if you keep at it soon, you begin to make your own rules. And I think for me, that's just the beauty of quilting. And of course, you get to share it with so many people who, who appreciates, you know, the work, the labor, and just the creativity of um, what you create. I do agree to what you said. You are a very powerful, creative person, number one. And then number two, um, quilting really gives you freedom. You see... As I've seen kilts all over the world, there is none or no nothing, um, nothing uh, really shows the same kilt. Everything is different. Even if they use the same pattern, it doesn't become the same. It is always different, and it is always an expression of oneself. So that's really one point that, um. Yeah, yeah, it's nice. Um, you've mentioned also that um kilting has been a part of your life. So I wonder how many years are, have you been kilting? You've mentioned a while back you're a newbie kilter. Um, but now I think it doesn't show because behind you, I think those are your fabrics and you're starting to yes. show progress, I think. <laughs> How long have you been quilting? Um, so I I made my first quilt. My first quilt took a long time because I was so discouraged. And, you know, in Nigeria, we don't have quilting shops or instructors. No, I couldn't just walk down the street or get into town and say, hey, come on, I'm having trouble with my quilt. Can you explain something to me? And honestly, at the time I started in 2016, there was almost no tutorial on African fabrics. So I found it doubly difficult to, to like translate the rules from other types of fabrics into African fabric. So it took me a really long time. I started, I think, around March of 2016. 
And I honestly didn't finish till around October. It took me so long because I got frustrated in the middle. I would drop it and say, I'm never doing this again. But because it stirred up something in me, I'd go back, you know, and then eventually I was able to finish and put it together and I was really happy. So I actually started quilting um, around March in 2016. And I still do that now. The demands of having young children running a business has not allowed me to quilt as often or as much as I would like. But one thing I know is that being in the Quilt Africa community, I've been able to assimilate so much, you know, because we have people of all levels of skill, some really amazingly creative people who, who do amazing things. And so just by having conversations and having hosting challenges and the summit, you know, and workshops, I've been able to assimilate so much. So I know so much, but the only challenge I have is I now have to sit down and put it into practice by actually making the quilts. You know, um, I have about three quilts in progress that I'm really hoping I can finish before the year ends. And I want to set myself another target of... Um, for next year to just try and at least make, you know, a few more quilts than I did last year. So um, I'm still a work in progress, but I think I'm in the right community to learn, you know, and to keep expressing myself and producing um, beautiful pieces. I think that's what's nice about Kilt Africa Fabrics. Since there are limited resources um, in certain areas across the, the globe, Kilt Africa Fabrics makes a bridge it's like a portal for every kilter around the world to have access to numerous resources and you know just practice kilting encourage um doing the kilts making the kilts so that eventually they will have masterpieces of their own and that is quite amazing and in your story Absolutely. based on your story it's quite fascinating that even without the resources, you were able to pull uh, it through. And, you know, you're able to establish from that particular desire to make a kilt. Now you have your company of your own. At the same time, you are one of the instruments used by God, you know, to, you know, bridge the resources to many kilters around the world. Since you've mentioned your story, what is your advice to kilters around the world, both beginners and those who are skilled in doing kilts? So um, I have a few things that I've picked up over the years. One is to just keep doing it. I know life happens and sometimes you're not able to. Life gets busy. Things happen, you know, but just continue to keep yourself in an environment where um, quilting is discussed, you know, um, by the time you do that, you keep your interest alive. It's like a fire. You don't let it die down. You know, we've had some people in the community who have been through some life changes. Some have lost loved ones, you know, and they took, they just couldn't create but just being in the community, being in the Quilt Africa tribe, listening, attending the summits, the challenges, the workshop, the live things that we do, you know, a, a little at a time, bit by bit, the desire to create, to create beauty, to come out of that dark place, you know, just um, they got inspired, you know, and they were able to just continue. That's one, you just have to find a community and I assure you that Quilt Africa Fabrics community is the right place to be. We make sure that we 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 offer both free and paid events, you know, to just keep you in there, keeping the rhythm of quilting in your life just by being in Quilt Africa tribe. Another thing I encourage um, you to do is to participate in challenges, in sew alongs, in quilt alongs. Um, in workshops, you know, it just exposes you to others. Honestly, you don't grow by yourself. And when you're with other people, they might not, they might even be at the same skill level as you are, but their creative process might be totally different from yours. The way they approach color, you know, or patterns or certain methods that they have are different from yours. And so you all, you're always in a process of learning, 
you know, that's the second thing. And then the third thing, of course, is to do as much as possible, have a project going on, you know, um, keep a project going on. Um, even if you work on it, like once a month, keep it going, stick to it, finish it, you know, and the joy, there's such a joy of accomplishment. You know, it just hits your brain in a very nice way, makes you feel good, makes you feel powerful, makes you feel accomplished, you know. So keep a project going. And number four, I will say is um, challenge yourself. For the longest time, I was terrified of half square triangles. I have no idea why. I did everything except curves and half square triangles. But I was so afraid of half square triangles. I just kept feeling I wouldn't get it. But when I finally did that, like two years ago, I was like, why was I so afraid of this? You know, so challenge yourself, face that technique, face the use of African fabrics because you think, oh my God, how can I put together the colors and the pack? Face it, you know, order yourself a mystery bundle, get into your stash, whatever you have, bring it out, work with it. Just keep um, challenging yourself. And the fifth thing I think I have to say is just enjoy the process. Enjoy the process. Don't sweat over it. If it's getting too overwhelming, put it away. You know, if the thing is not coming together, put it away, give it some time, pull it out. You would have felt refreshed because quilting is supposed to be pleasure. It's not supposed to be pain. So if you're ever at a comes pain, you know, take a step back and recharge and come back to it. So for me, these are my top five um, pieces of advice that I follow myself and I hope will help someone. That's nice. So again, that's five reasons to kill. Number one is, of course, to keep going. Number two, um, you should join challenges, expose yourself to webinars. And then number three, mm -hmm. you should um, keep the project going, involve yourself in a project that you will make and have a target that you will finish it on a certain time. And then number four, of course, you have to face your fears, yeah. just like what Miriam mentioned. So um, I'm pretty sure we as individuals have our own fears in making projects. So I, for one, am not a kilter, but I might be one eventually. So let's see where this journey will take me. Yes. And then <laughs> last but not least, number five is, yes. of course, enjoy yourself. Enjoy the process. And, you know, just express yourself um, in doing the kilt. Enjoy the process of making kilts and putting fabrics together. It's quite fascinating how um, pieces of fabrics make a certain art, uh, art piece. So, yeah, kilters around the world, I salute you there. So, moving forward, since you've mentioned keep going, what are the things that the tribe can look forward in 2024 as we keep going to the next year? Okay, so for next year, we are going to be on a roll. We're going to keep moving forward. And so for next year, um, I discovered that the challenges we host really keep people engaged, really inspires them, really keep challenges them really to keep doing more. And so we're going to have more challenges in 2024. We're going to have more workshops. And of course, there's the July summit to look forward to. We're making a few changes, you know, and um, that's going to be big. Of course, that's really big on our calendar. And that is still there. And a few other things, a few webinars, a few more webinars, a few more talks, you know, that are geared towards the culture and the traditions behind um, the fabrics. And yeah, so I think there's a lot to look forward to. And I hope you join us, you stay with us, you invite other people into the tribe because 2024 is going to be another good year for us. That's right, Miriam. Indeed, we do have an exciting 2024 for everyone as we do have a lot of events and activities in store for them this coming year. Speaking of upcoming events, we would like to invite everyone to our forthcoming activity, our webinar on Saturday. That's November 25, 9 a.m. Eastern Time. Um, that's on Mama Africa, Spotlight on Iconic African Women, wherein we will be sharing with you how this iconic women transformed African culture and how they influence Africa today. 
Let us be inspired and continue our journey in Kelting. So that's it. Thank you for joining us in today's episode. This has been Jason. And see you again in the next episode of Kilt Africa TV, where we bring you closer to African fabrics and quilting.